If you go on a Google search and you type in, for instance, vaccine development process or timeline, you don't even need to put COVID, but what you're going to see, and I want to show you here with images, is that there's a lot, a lot of information available on the processes because all of us are trying to understand, you know, how long would it take and why would it take this long? Why a vaccine is not produced like in Hollywood movies, you know, in within hours of having a disease. So basically what you see in all of these searches, the result is basically the same message. You have to start by selecting the viral material for your vaccination. Then you have to select the technology, which is also called sometimes the platform or the blueprint. Then you create a formulation for injection to human beings. Then you do preclinical test and you move on to clinical phase one, phase two and phase three. Once the results are ready, you prepare the dossier for submitting it for registration and eventually approval. And the last step is manufacturing for the needs of the world. So this is, in a nutshell, the process that's needed. And in this particular video, I will walk you through selection of the viral material that's in the public domain for the current vaccines that are in development. What is the technology platform or blueprint? I will not explain the formulation. That's another step. It's, it's extremely complex, but I'm not going to go into that detail, but very briefly, I will explain what the clinical testing and then the clinical phase one, phase two, and phase three require. All of the programs today in development are in any one of these boxes. None of them has achieved yet the level of registration and much less manufacturing. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in this particular video. To begin, I want to do like a teaser with uh, some questions and these questions are posed for you. You can pause the video, you can print it, you can copy them. Just take a look at them. You can attempt to respond them and we will go over the correct answers and the rationale for the answers as I move on in this presentation. So let's begin. So although SARS-CoV-2 shares a lot of different features with other viral particles, there has been five genes that have been identified as having in their sequence some specific elements that are unique for SARS-CoV-2. And this is very important for classifying and identifying the virus. So let's take a look at which one are the five specific genes of this particular viral particle. And they are all encoded in RNA because this is an RNA virus. So the first one that a lot of people have now seen and know about is the gene that encodes for the spike glycoprotein, which is depicted here in red. And that is actually the protein that is expressed on the membrane of the viral particle. And it's the one the viral particle uses to infect cells. The next one would be the membrane protein. This particular protein, as you can see here in orange, is very helpful for the viral particle to maintain the integrity as a particle by producing a stable membrane. Then we have the nucleoprotein. And in this case, this nucleoprotein is the one that's going to protect the RNA. It is inside the viral particle. This is not expressed in the surface. And again, the coding and the sequence are specific and unique for the SARS-CoV-2. We have then the envelope, small membrane protein, which is here depicted in, in yellow. And finally, we have a gene for a functional protein, that it's the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and was described in the science paper of 2020. I would like to direct you now to an excellent paper from Scientific American called A Visual Guide to the SARS-CoV-2. What we have here is a simple schematic that compares the genome length with certain known viruses and coronavirus. And right away, you can see evidently the key message. The genome of the SARS-CoV-2 is 
super long. It is longer than many of the other viruses that we know. What does this mean? It means that there's a lot of genes in there besides the structural genes that this virus has that can actually provide this virus with some advantages for sophisticated replication. One of the enzymes that this genome contains is exonuclease. And this exonuclease is normally an enzyme that will proofread and correct copies of the gene. So every cell and every gene that is replicated uh, has random mutations. And normally, the more sophisticated mechanisms can proofread and correct those mutations. In the viruses that are smaller and they do not have this proofreading mechanism, they can start having mutations along the line several years. And eventually, if you have a vaccine against the particular protein that mutated, that vaccine could be rendered not efficacious after a certain amount of time because of mutations of the virus. In this case, the prediction is, if I interpret the information correctly from this particular paper and other papers, this actually is a, an observation that predicts that the mutations that could happen in the structural genes of the SARS-CoV-2 have a mechanism for being corrected. And it is expected that if we do have a successful vaccine, because this virus will correct its own mutations, the vaccine could potentially work in future and we don't have to encounter the same situation as with the influenza vaccine, for instance, that every so often the vaccine has to change because the virus is mutating and changing. Using this same paper from the Scientific American, we are going over more details on how the RNA is arranged in this SARS-CoV-2 genome, again, about 30,000 bases long. There are accessory genes that are within the RNA instruction regions for the structural proteins, which contain the gene for the spike protein and the genes for the envelope, membrane, and nucleocapsid proteins, which are specific proteins for this SARS-CoV-2 virus. The RNA instructions for the non-structural proteins occupy a longer space in the viral genome, and they are the ones that include the polymerase and the exonuclease that we had mentioned. So let's go over the first questions as statements that are either true or false. Number one is, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus that has information for five specific structural genes. This is false. It contains the information for four specific structural genes and one specific functional gene and many, many other genes that are not very specific for this particular virus. SARS-CoV-2 RNA has more non-structural than structural genes. This is true. The SARS-CoV-2 gene structure suggests that the virus may not require changes in vaccine due to a mechanism that proofreads and corrects gene mutations. And this is true if I read the literature correctly. I am using the paper that came out in the Journal of Clinical Pathology in 2020 to show a bit of what we know of the RNA gene that encodes a spike protein. So as we saw before, it's a structural uh, protein. So this is the RNA gene for the structural protein that's the spike in the coronavirus. And it is a larger genetic sequence compared, for instance, to the envelope or the membrane genes. Those are smaller proteins. 
So the spike protein is the one that the virus uses to infect the cells. And it has several components. Within the spike protein, we have the genes that encode for the region that's called the S1 region. And within that region, which is the one that is expressed in the outermost part of the, of the viral particle, we have the receptor binding domain. That's the region that the virus is going to use to bind our cells and infect them. And then the S2 region of the spike protein gives a structural uh, sort of solidity to that spike and also it provides the area where that spike protein is going to be binding to the membrane of the viral particle. I am showing a 3D image. To my knowledge, this was the first 3D image that was published and it was done by Jason McLennan at the University of Texas in Austin. So because we have now identified one of the proteins that it's not only specific for SARS-CoV-2, but also plays an important role in infection. Let's take a look at how important it would be to use parts or this protein alone for the vaccine development. So first thing I want to uh, explain my interpretation of con concepts that I drew from a webinar that was a presentation of some work that has been funded by the Gates Foundation. So what they did was, uh, and this was very early on, was one of the first stages, extremely useful. They looked at patients who had had the disease. They had been extremely sick with COVID-19, but they recovered. So these patients were convalescent and it's convalescent serum samples. Uh, perhaps that's why I gave it such a weird haircut. But anyway, these patients donated blood and in their blood, there's antibodies to the virus. And because they recovered, the idea was to see what pieces of the particle are these antibodies binding from these patients. So what they tested was these blood samples against the whole particle. Then they also tested them against the S1 region of the spike protein. And then they also used the receptor binding site or the receptor binding domain, which is within the S1, but just that piece. And they also tested against the S2 region. So if the antibodies from these patients bound to any of these regions on the laboratory test, then they would come back with a measurement for those antibodies that are now bound to the plate. And they actually saw which ones were the ones that were really conveying the protection against the virus. And what they found is that both the antibodies to the S1 and the antibodies to their receptor binding domain are the ones most prevalent in people who recovered from the virus. And also doing some additional testing in vitro, they actually realized that these antibodies from these patients uh, were able to neutralize the growth of the virus in cell culture. So this is a very important observation very early on. Without this information, it would have been really hard to process or progress with uh, development for vaccines without knowing exactly which is the piece of the virus that we need to use to elicit our immune response to that piece of the virus. That's what a vaccine needs to have, the appropriate stimulus for our immune system. And this research together with other observations was instrumental in helping us understand that it's the spike region and within the spike protein, it's the S1 region and the receptor binding site, the very two good candidates for eliciting an immune response if we use the vaccine. Question number four. All specific structural genes produce proteins that are good candidates to create an efficacious vaccine. It is not true. We have seen now that it's basically the spike protein. The the best candidate for an effect efficacious vaccine. Targeting the receptor binding site with a vaccine can be expected to generate a protective immune response. This is true. 
It may also be true for the whole S1 region, but definitely the two of them might provide protection and they are very good candidates for vaccine development. Using this cartoon that was published in Scientific American in June 2020, I will walk you through the different ways that a vaccine for COVID-19 can be developed. Now, a more in-depth explanation of this technology is in my other YouTube video called Evolution, the Making of Vaccines. But let's just review what this means. We see on the left, we have an option of attenuating a virus for using it in a vaccine. Basically, this would mean taking the SARS-CoV-2 and through different patch passages on cell culture, basically you can change the tissue where you're putting the virus. It basically weakens the genetic material of the virus. So that way this virus is weaker, but it still presents the immunogenic aspects of the virus or the, or the viral particle to the individual and is a good way of making vaccines. The second way that a virus can be used is by inactivating it and this requires a chemical process. Usually after several passages in culture you inactivate it with a chemical like formaldehyde and in this case this virus is rendered inactive. So it is a safer way of having the whole virus as the antigen in your vaccine is the material for your vaccine but you don't have the risk of generating a disease. And the last way of using uh, different particles from the virus would be just to select specific subunits of a virus. And in the case of the COVID-2, we could use the whole spike protein, for instance, and that can be used for injecting individuals with the spike protein. So now you don't have the rest of the virus. You don't have the genetic material of the virus. You're only injecting a piece of the protein of the virus and there's no risk of disease and this is the piece of the virus that our immune system would identify it and cross react with the whole virus so by injecting with only the spike protein we generate defenses against the whole virus and this can also be done just using the receptor binding site of the virus. So this is one of the ways that traditionally vaccines can be generated. To my understanding, currently this technology is being pursued uh, by different laboratories, but not the attenuated virus, just the inactivated and the subunits or protein vaccines. Next would be to generate a vaccine using the viral genetic material that is engineered for a vaccine. For more details, please take a look at the video called Evolution, the Making of Vaccines in my same channel. So what happens here is that we have a coding gene. Let's say, as an example, we decided to select the S1 protein. So we have the RNA gene from the virus that encodes for the S1. This particular gene then is injected in the patient as a vaccine and the patient will use their own machinery to generate the messenger RNA and the protein that we are interested in. For instance, it could be the whole S1 protein or the whole spike protein, or it could be the receptor binding domain only. So the important thing here is that we are using the coding gene. We select what are we coding for. A novel technology is using a messenger RNA instead of the RNA from the virus. And this is a new technology for vaccines where in the laboratory a messenger RNA is constructed for use as vaccine material. So in this particular technology, there is no material coming from the virus. 
we are generating the messenger RNA in the laboratory with the complementary sequence of the viral coding gene. And this is a messenger RNA from humans, and we just introduce it in the human being for the injection, and the result should be the same, having the same protein that is synthesized. These two genetic materials are being used and developed as vaccines using any one of the three potential ways to generate this vaccine. So the gene, yet, you know, either the RNA from the virus or the messenger RNA has been embedded either in a DNA plasmid or in, a, in an RNA lipid, a nanoparticle, or in an adenovirus. So all of these technologies are being used to develop vaccines for COVID-2. In this same paper from Scientific American, the next part of the cartoon shows what happens once we have selected the material for the vaccine. So we put it in a solution and then we need to start testing. The first step is preclinical trials. So once we have the material that we selected and that we have the vaccine ready for injection, we have to understand if it is toxic, if it's not toxic, what is the level that we need to use. And then at the same time is understanding is our material in the vaccine generating or triggering the appropriate immune response. So in vitro, is it inhibiting the, the SARS-CoV-2 from infecting cells in tissue culture? Is it inhibiting them from growing and from expanding? So this is a very important step that has been greatly accelerated for COVID vaccines because of the tremendous need that the world has of getting a vaccine. We cannot have the luxury of waiting 20 years or 30 years for a vaccine. So uh, without uh, doing this step by step, there's a lot of risk that has been taken into developing things in parallel, going ahead and producing the vials that are needed for human trials while we are still testing in, in animals so that the day we see the results in animals, we can technically just start the human trials is at risk of investment. And there's a lot of hours and work that is being put up front so that things can move very fast. So once the preclinical trials are identifying that, yes, we should move on, this step has been done really very quickly with phase one. In phase one, there's about, you know, anywhere between 10 and 100 patients tested. And typically what this does is basically saying, OK, are the patients injected producing antibodies? And as I mentioned at the same step, is not just any antibody, but just making sure that these antibodies are neutralized in the virus when tested in the laboratory. So this is normally done. And then once we have all the results and analyze them, we go on to phase two. In the phase two, we need to understand if the immune response is strong enough. So it's not just are they producing antibodies, but what are the titers of the antibodies? And in general, these titers are compared with the titers or the levels of the antibodies of people that have uh, had the disease and recovered. So that's what we call convalescent sera. It is a very good uh, sort of control that we have saying if the convalescent sera level was X and our vaccine is producing 4X or fourfold the amount of antibodies that the convalescent sera has, that's a very good vaccine response. We don't want to have a lower level than the convalescent sera. It's always better to have higher levels of the antibodies that showed to be protective. What you have seen and what I will show you next 
is that most of the companies now working on COVID-2 have been able to accelerate the process by doing the trials that are called phase 1-2. In other words, in one same protocol, they are joining the phase one to the phase two. So they're starting to recruit more patients without closing the trial as soon as they start seeing results in the laboratory that are conducive to understanding which dose has to be continued. So that's why these trials have gone very fast in understanding the immune response of the vaccine material that is being tested. And the next step is going to phase three. The key difference is that in phase one and phase two, we're looking at the efficacy of the vaccine in terms of the vaccine being able to mount an immune response by looking at the levels of antibodies. But in phase three, we need to demonstrate that it can prevent infection. This is following guidelines from regulatory agencies. For a vaccine development, we not only need to have a vaccine that creates antibodies, we need to have the demonstration, scientific evidence, that the vaccine significantly prevented infection. In phase three trials, we have placebo groups and groups that are injected. And these are trials that look at clinical outcomes. In other words, we need to count the events that are happening. So how many people are going to get infected in the next wave of COVID-2 if they were injected with placebo versus injected with the vaccine? And those are the numbers that need to show a significant improvement. Again, the FDA guidelines for COVID-19 development, vaccine development were issued recently, and they explain what is the level necessary for a vaccine to be considered a phase three successful study. But just look at the fact that given the numbers and given the expected observed events and the expected events, we need more than tens of thousands of patients in phase three. So this is the reason why creating a vaccine, developing a vaccine, testing a vaccine and having it from the beginning to the end in the market has taken more than 20 years in average. And this is why it is a, an extraordinary e event, what's happening with COVID-19, that all the world is pulling together with many different vaccines in development in the hopes that we have not one, not two, but hopefully many vaccines available to be able to help the whole world and have sufficient vaccines that are all effective, all safe, and all approved for everybody to have access to them. This is a beautiful image of a Russian icon from the 16th century of the Common Era. We see here Sophia the Martyr with three daughters. So who was Sophia? Sophia from Greek mythology is the idea of wisdom, cleverness. And she became Saint Sophia in the Christian world of knowledge and wisdom. So I parallel Sophia with science. It's knowledge, wisdom, cleverness. And it is very important in the story of this martyrdom that Sophia died of natural causes after her three daughters were martyred and killed. Uh, the first uh, story goes, uh, it's documented from the sixth century that apparently this particular saint and her daughters were martyred under the reign of Emperor Hadrian. But let's take a look at uh, what killed Sophia. Sophia died again of natural causes when they killed faith, hope, and charity. I think this is a very strong message because nowadays we're living the same. We need science, but we need faith. 
we need hope and we need to think of charity in the times of COVID-19 pandemia. So let's take a look at all of the programs in development currently for a vaccine against COVID-19. I want to show you the page from the World Health Organization. It's called the Draft Landscape of COVID-19 Candidates. I just want to let you know I printed this on August 10th, 2020. I encourage you to go to the page because this page is being updated all the time. So I don't want to go for hard numbers here, just an example of what you can find. Just note that when you download this file, which is a PDF file, um, as of August of 2020, there's nine pages. And I will give you an example of what you will find in this registry. So let me show you how the table looks as of August 16th, 2020. First thing is we see that there's 26 candidates in clinical evaluation. This is great news because the more candidates there are, the more chances we have of having not one or two, but several vaccines available worldwide. They note what is the clinical stage from phase one to phase three. And also you can click on the links that explain what is the clinical trial design and what are the details of those trials. So again, I encourage you to go directly to this page and check what is happening in the landscape of vaccines for COVID-19. In there, they explain what is the vaccine platform. And this is the explanations that I've given in a little more detail in my other YouTube channel called Evolution, the Making of Vaccines. But I briefly touched on them here. And you can see that there's inactivated virus used as vaccine material. This is the one that requires most likely a chemical step like formaldehyde to inactivate the virus. So they give the whole virus, but it's inactivated. It cannot produce disease. There's also a protein subunit. So from the virus, it is a protein subunit. And in this case is the receptor binding domain dimer. So that's the one that is given is not the whole virus is just a subunit. This is very similar to the hepatitis B vaccine, for instance, and it will trigger an appropriate immune response. Then we have the nucleic acid platforms that can use a non-replicating viral vector. So in this case, the piece of gene that's important from the virus is included in an adenovirus as a platform for the vaccine for injecting that RNA. And finally, we have the RNA based technology. And in this case, in this page, both of them are the new technology using messenger RNA for the vaccination. In one case, we have in a lipid nano nanoparticle that's encapsulated and in the other one, it's just mentioned as lipid nanoparticle. So we can see that just in the first page, we have several different platforms being investigated as vaccines. So eventually we may have access to several vaccines and it might be of interest to you to know if you can choose, do you prefer to have the inactivated virus or a protein subunit or a non-replicating viral vector or a messenger RNA vaccine. The pages continue because as you, as you saw, it's 26 candidates. So in this page, we have the same format of the table. And now we see that there's also DNA platform. So a DNA platform is the one that uses the DNA plasmid for the nucleic acid vaccines. This is another way of providing the vaccine material in a formulation that's good for a vaccine. So in this last page of the list of clinical trials for a vaccine, you can see the same platforms being used. And there's one that had not been listed before. 
and that's a platform using the RNA from the virus is not the messenger RNA, but this one uses a technology that's called self-amplifying RNA technology. And for more details, I encourage you to look at the Imperial College of London webpage. They explain their technology and how this vaccine is supposed to be working. So, in addition, there's 138 candidates in preclinical evaluation. So I hope that you realize there's a lot of hope for the future. There's a lot of vaccine development activities. And definitely with all of these programs in development, some of them faster than others, but hopefully we will have a good armamentarium for having sufficient COVID vaccines in the future for the world. This is Pandora by Lawrence Alma Tadima. It's a watercolor from 1881. I first uh, saw a painting by Lawrence Alma Tadima in the Antiques Roadshow program, and then I started looking for his work. And this is an absolutely astonishing watercolor. So why am I talking about Pandora? And you can see in his painting that Pandora doesn't have a box. Everybody talks about Pandora's box, but you can see she has a jar. And he was accurate because the original uh, story says that Pandora had a pythos, and this is a typical amphora. So it was basically a jar or an amphora. And of course, the one that I'm depicting here from the Louvre, uh, it's from, 675 before uh, our common era. But of course, the one that Pandora holds needs to have a lid. Because the story is that Pandora opened a jar that had been left in her care. And she had been told not to open it, but she did. And when she opened the jar, this jar was containing sickness, death, and many other unspecified evils which were then released into the world. This resonates with me a lot with what's happening with COVID-19 pandemia. So there's evidently sickness and death, but there's many other unspecified evils that we're seeing in society by some very negative responses in some cases of social behaviors that are being triggered by this anxiety, this level of uncertainty, fear, and everything that's happening around us, all the limitations, all these things about quarantine, isolation, closing markets, closing borders, and everybody saying what's happening. So Pandora's jar was opened in November 2019. And what came out was sickness, death, and many other unspecified evils. Now let's also remember that she hastened to close the container, but then she realized that there was a very small figure that was left behind, crouching in the bottom of the jar, afraid, alone, and scared. And her name was Hope. So now let's take a look at the last questions. A vaccine with the RBD gene or protein can be expected to generate a protective immune response. Yes, this is true. Um, it's also expected that the S1 gene or protein or even the whole inactivated virus could provide a protective immune response. So this is a true statement. Vaccine clinical trials require demonstration of neutralizing antibodies in phase one in convalescent patients. No, this is not true. We don't use convalescent patients because most likely these patients already have serum antibodies. So what we need is people who don't have antibodies so that we know that whatever we are seeing in their blood corresponds to a response to the vaccine and not to a previous infection. 
we use the convalescent sera to compare the titers of the antibodies generated by the vaccine to the titers that the convalescent patients had. So the answer is this is false. No current COVID-19 strategy includes using whole virus adapted for vaccination such as inactivation. No, this is not true because currently there are some strategies that use inactivated virus. So that's why this answer would be wrong. What I haven't found is anybody yet using attenuated virus. It's basically inactivated, but they are using this technology. I hope you enjoyed watching this uh, video and that you learned as much as I did creating it. And please check my YouTube channel for other videos. Thank you very much.